Alex Answer here. It is the evening of July 23rd, 2016. And we're joined by a friend of ours, Kyle Reardon. He's done a lot of work investigating the uh, situation in Burns, Oregon, as well as Costilla County. And he is in Central Texas. What we're going to discuss are some of the bullet points made by Donald Trump and what it really means. We're going to decode some of the things that he said, interpret what it really means, what it really means for America. Kyle, what are some of the uh, initial thoughts that you have after watching uh, the uh, ABC News uh, highlight video of Donald Trump's speech? Well, Alex, I mean, I was really concerned with the Donald, or let me just say Mr. Trump, when he was constantly mentioning about how he is the law and order candidate. And even the phrase law and order, I was not even intentionally, but I was keeping count of how many times he used the phrase law and order. I stopped counting after the fifth time he said it. So it was very, very repetitive, overly repetitive, I thought, and how he was emphasizing so much on law and order. But then what does he mean by that? And, you know, we can look back to the Bush presidency and even some of Obama's speeches and how many times they mentioned ISIS. Well, with that, with Obama, but with Bush, terrorism, terrorism, terrorism. We look back at the, uh, the RNC from 2004. And at that time, people were very critical of that. You know, fear-mongering. We must have war with the Middle East. Inner Donald Trump and inner Alex Jones of the RNC, which we'll touch on. And now all this is okay. With Donald Trump, it was barbarians, 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 you know, in addition to the law and order. And these people that used to say, and quote the founding fathers, you know, specifically uh, those that would trade their liberty for security, deserve neither. Kyle, are you hearing so-called patriots use that quote lately in the last year, in the last couple of years? I've heard them say a lot of things, Alex, and unfortunately, and I think this was covered upon in a previous podcast you and I did, and for those who may not have listened to that, the long and short of it is this. The neoconservatives have infiltrated the patriot movement, and I think that's in large part why there's been very strange, in a bad way, events that have been occurring, and also equally strange rhetoric, not in a good way, that has been coming from the patriot community uh, not just this first half of 2016, but I would say pretty much throughout the entirety of 2015 as well, with the demonization of people who are not just Muslims, but also those various peoples of a broader Arabic ancestry as well, which is really disconcerting to me because I've been anti-war, geez, at least since the Bush, George W. Bush years, if not maybe a little bit before then. Uh, because I remember when I was a child and the government murdered the men, women, and children at Waco, and there were other conflicts that the federal government was involved in, whether it was uh, Bosnia or other places, and sticking their nose in where it doesn't belong and murdering people. And that was my introduction to government. So now that, and I remember when the patriot community used to be anti war, and now, and now, Alex, wow. Um, you know, the only people I've noticed who are still consistently anti-war seem to be libertarians. But aside from that, uh, the patriot movements, you know, with their advocacy of restoring constitutional government, something happened to them. I'm not exactly certain, you know, and perhaps that would be a little bit of a deeper topic in terms of uh, the sequence of events in the history. But suffice it to say, something has happened, which has now led to their advocacy in large part for Donald Trump, who uh, I sincerely believe is a fascist. Uh, no holds bar, Alexander, you know, Hamiltonian mercantilism and uh, excise taxes and tariffs and basically that entire program of protectionism. You know, I think I think uh, Donald Trump has said uh, has said just as much. He even admired Hamilton in one of his speeches on so-called economic policy. So that, I think, is rather disconcerting how much those people who were anti-establishment have now completely in large part, with very few exceptions, have, well, quite frankly, I think the, it's important for the audience to understand, they have completely flipped their shit. And unfortunately, too few content producers within the alternative media have pointed this out. Uh, thankfully, some have, but uh, I wish more would. I think there's a fair amount of common sense that's been thrown out the window. Here's an example. Okay, so we have Trump's plan to restore America to greatness by prohibiting corporations 
from relocating overseas. That doesn't sound like free market. No, no, it's not. In fact, it is mercantilist. And that is, and that is more along the lines of what Alexander Hamilton advocated when he was Secretary of State back in the 1790s. You know, one thing I want to say about Black Lives Matter, I think that there are some legitimate issues that have been raised. I, I'm opposed to like the mob mentality, and I've been very critical of that. But what I'm seeing from the Trump supporters and the Alex Jones supporters is this you're with us or you're with George Soros. And so, you know, it's one thing to say, OK, George Soros has a part to play in protests and funding certain groups. OK, I'll give him that. But to say that everybody that opposes the Trump presidency is a Soros shill, I mean, that that is like it's a straw man argument. It's not a legitimate argument based on real research. And I've been noticing this even before Trump. Soros behind this and Soros behind that. Well, the truth of the matter is, Kyle, there's a certain amount of people in Occupy that are genuine protesters that believe in that type of this is what democracy is and we're making a stand in the streets and they're obviously being very influenced by the mainstream media but to say that it's all soros is to defeat their own arguments yes and see there's there's also one other problem here too i don't think a lot of people really understand which which is simply this black lives matter actually issued a manifesto not too long ago where they where they listed their 10 point planks almost like the communist manifesto right with the, with the 10 points or planks and the fact of the matter is after looking over it i do agree with black lives matter on three of their claims on their on their grievances all of which involve and <laughs> involve reducing government power either ending something abolishing something or repealing something um, and one of those, of course, civil asset forfeiture, which is a real grievance. The problem, though, with BLM's manifesto is that they then mix in with their other seven points, other types of grievances, which I think are fake and not real grievances. And even if people wanted to say they were real grievances, it usually ends up in a policy direction, which is something I fundamentally disagree with. One of which being they want to essentially coddle the police and reform the police and make nice nice with the police, which is something I absolutely do not support because I understand economics. So unfortunately, I think Black Lives Matter is ultimately being used as controlled opposition. Uh, and especially considering when, when you mentioned in some of your most recent videos about uh, that, that Strickland character and, and the weird so, uh, the social dynamics that were at play there in that particular uh, incident in Portland. And if people want to watch that video, they should definitely check that out. And, you know, that is just one of many situations where there's tensions, where people are getting really emotional on both sides. Strickland has the right, by the way, to consult Kerry. A little bit of criticism on how he responded the way the gun was kind of pointed in kind of a, a, a sweeping motion. He did holster it right away, but he did not retreat from the situation as quickly as he could. And I'm just going to say, you know, that could, that could endanger someone's safety if they then get attacked by a mob and they're not actually ready to pull the trigger or may not want to pull the trigger. That would have been a really bad thing. I think we all agree on that. Mm -hmm. So just a little thing I want to add in there. But absolutely in agreement, there's been a hijacking of Black Lives Matter. Minimum wage, the whole minimum wage thing was mixed in as well. <laughs> yeah. Now, I want to go back to a few bullet points. You know, there was, um, as you said, a lot of focus on law and order. And here we have Alex Jones that was actually putting out some violent rhetoric towards the police between 2005 and 2009. And so we've talked about the shift from the old Alex Jones to the new Alex Jones. And we've been kind of marveling at this anomaly, at this endorsement of the ultimate police state candidate. And the way that he's been able to accrue nude audience members and completely spit in the face of his traditional supporters, the people that are old school, you know, the people that would actually join him in the streets with the megaphones, you know, and be smeared by the mainstream media. Oh, look at these 9-11 conspiracy theorists. So as far as I'm concerned, he doesn't really represent the 9-11 movement anymore. At one point he did, like it or not, because he played such a prominent role in that and he was making decent documentary films but now in hindsight some of those 9-11 films were missing certain pieces of information 
and had other claims and assertions that went above and beyond. And so the point I'm trying to make is from the beginning, Alex Jones was putting out questionable information, but there was more truth. Now, you know, we, we can look at his, the mirroring of the talking points between him and Trump are startling. And we can also watch that video with Alex Jones crashing a protest, the RNC, saying that, you know, there's all these communists there that were calling for police to be killed. However, they weren't exactly doing that when he was there, that group that he was yelling at. I just saw a guy with a megaphone using bodyguards to cut into the crowd. Okay, we're going over this way. Now we're going over that way. And he walked into that situation with police protection, which I did not notice at first, Kyle. I noticed it at the end, you know, when the police protected him after he basically, like a, like a bull in a china shop, nearly fell over. Now, from a martial arts perspective, that's incredibly incompetent as a human being to nearly fall over when you're overreacting to someone nudging you. And not to defend the people that nudged him, but he's, he's going into their physical space with a megaphone. And I'd megaphone, Kyle, and it is an aggressive thing when you're hurting people's eardrums, free speech or not. When you're blasting people's eardrums and you're coming up to them in their face, I don't care what people say about free speech. That's aggressive behavior. And so, you know, when I was out there megaphoning about 9-11, I did try to be a little bit tactful and not directly blast them in their face. I always had a rule, be at least 20 or 30 feet away and don't hit them when there's little kids there. So what we saw was Alex Jones walk in with police and leave with a mob of police. And so I think people really should take note of this. Uh, a couple other things that we'll throw out real quick and then we'll get back to the Trump highlights. He, he also paid a trip to the Young Turks. Now I'm not a fan of them, but what was really telling Kyle is the style of argument that Alex was using against Cenk, and I'm sure you saw that video as well. Yes, I did. Okay, oh, you guys were the Saudis. You guys were with the jihadis. Right there, right there. He's going to a point where, and, and Cenk is Middle Eastern, Cenk is Turkish. Was that not somehow relating to Turk? The young Turks oh, have to be Middle Eastern host. And so, you know, it was interesting, like right on cue, Someone comments on my Alex Jones deception video series because, as you know, I'm mixed and on the mixed side, on my father's side, it's Middle Eastern. But it's not Arab. So this person goes, screw you, F you, Alex is the king, F you, Arab. Mm. See, years ago, Alex Jones audience members, members did not act like that. I mean, you had, a, you had a really small fringe aspect of the old school Alex Jones listenership that would respond in a highly racialized way. It was mostly about the Jews then. Things really have shifted actually, I think in some ways from Israel and Zionism with some of these folks to the Arabs. We can also look at Alex Jones for years saying the Arabs run Hollywood, you know, and people for years were scratching their head going, why are you saying it's the Arabs when it's this small select group of Jews, not all Jews, but you know, the Zionists. And I'm not big on labeling everything a Jewish conspiracy either. So these are some really important bullet points regarding the shift of Alex Jones to this Trump narrative. Now, Trump was discussing going after the barbarians in a more aggressive way than I saw than Bush or Obama. And I'll pause right there and get your thoughts. He was whipping the audience up. You know, back in the day, people would Go, oh, look, Bush is showing like the devil horns. It's an Illuminati conspiracy. Oh, Obama is showing the devil horns. It's an Obama the Muslim conspiracy. Let's go back at that tape and see how many of, of his recent speech and see how many times he's showing the devil horns. Let's go back at that speech and look how many times he's making the 666 when the index and the thumb are together, you know? And you're doing that multiple times, that's believed by many conspiracy researchers to be a form of symbolism that's being sent to the audience. Kyle, did you catch any of that? I didn't particularly catch the hand gestures because that's not my field of study. I was really more listening to the rhetoric, which I'm, okay. which I'm noticeably better with. And what really kind of concerned me was how much of that imagery that Donald Trump was channeling 
uh, in very much the same way that a strong man in many of these uh, Central and South American banana republics do, uh, much like uh, somebody who's the head of a military junta. Uh, that was very much the impression I got. Not only that, there is an article by pretty much the only Austrian economist I honestly do not like at all. His name's Jeffrey Tucker, and he wrote an article called Trumpism, where he was trying to legitimize reasons why libertarians liked Donald Trump's speech at Freedom Fest, the last one that took place. And I was just flabbergasted by his rationalization of how this authoritarian is somehow a, a libertarian icon. Like that article, and if you give me a moment, I can try and pull it up just for purposes of reference to the audience, but Trumpism, that article was so scary to me because bad enough the patriot community has been co-opted because of the neocons and uh, the xenophobia regarding not even so much Muslims in one sense, but those of a broader Arabic uh, ancestry. Now they're going after libertarians specifically. And this is also exacerbated by the fact that Donald Trump has pretty much co-opted the broader uh, sentiment of people who are fed up with political correctness, which, oh, by the way, the Patriots dropped the ball on that one, too, but it was the Libertarians who picked that up and really have been pushing against the social justice warriors harder than anyone, at least until Donald Trump entered the scene. And now I've noticed a lot of Libertarians backing off of uh, calling out the SJWs on their uh, politically correct nonsense. So I'm getting really concerned. You know, it's one thing if the Patriots want to go off and be a bunch of ignorant hicks in that stereotypical way. But now they're coming after my people, and my people are now getting co-opted as I view it. That is what really kind of concerns me, Alex. Let's touch also upon Hillary. Now, I'm not a Hillary supporter, but the way that I've seen the uh, Google News, you know, the, the mainstream alternative sites, I've seen the mainstream and alternative media in almost a state of lockstep with this idea of criminality and current politics all being pushed on the current Secretary of State. And I'm not a fan of her, but to make it all about one person, Hillary and or Obama, and then to go anybody but Hillary, you know, this is insane. So the FBI foils the investigation and Trump comes out and says, you know, this is BS. In my opinion, this has always been by design to make it look like the system ultimately does favor and will protect Hillary Clinton. And to a certain extent, that's correct. But why has this been made the number one news story? Kind of interesting. And then we see the, back to Alex Jones, the Hillary for prison shirts and others in the alternative media that rant with a sense of manufactured emotion in their YouTube speeches. You know, there's one particular person that comes to mind that will remain unnamed and, um, you know, puts out a video, which he's put out a lot regarding ISIS being a, a CIA creation. And so he'll have some videos that are about that theme. And then saying, but Donald Trump is right for saying that we should ban all immigration. Now, let's get to the fine print. What did Trump say in the last speech? countries compromised by terrorism. Now that's big. How many countries now supposedly are compromised by terrorism? That was of course placed there in these areas that were destabilized. Quite a few, we can go down the list. That's pretty epic because we've had immigration from some of these countries, Iraqis, Afghanis, others. And I don't believe that we've seen genuine terror attacks in these individuals. You know, I mean, you have countless millions of peaceful Muslims, like Islam or not. It's just how it is. People are just going to have to deal with that reality. We yeah. don't have the time, though, to go over the stuff that people should already know, that this extreme Sharia law stuff, even though Sharia is referenced in the Quran, most Muslims have a different interpretation of Sharia. And uh, some of these so-called libertarians are out of their fucking mind. And they're literally in other people's faces saying what other people believe when, in fact, that's not the truth. That's not the truth that every Muslim family lives by this form of Sharia law, that every female has her genitals mutilated. I mean, this is simply not the case. 
And so to see Alex Jones, who knows better, go in this direction with Trump, you know, a lot of people have felt that this Alex Jones guy is being set up for a political career, whether it be running for office or, you know, a spot at Fox News. Uh, you know, I'm not really a believer that's going to be Fox News, but he's definitely being set up for a greater role in the mainstream media. You know, I, I just wish that some of these so-called researchers could see that there are contradictions here. I saw the contradiction when I saw people with a bumper sticker in Portland. On one side, it says Barack Obama. On the other end of the car, the bumper, it says coexist. Also a very famous sticker. I'm sure you see him in Austin, Kyle, the coexist ones with the uh, yes, six-point star. Yeah. Okay, that's schizophrenia. You have nine out of ten. We've been trying to explain this to Obama supporters for how long now? <laughs> nine out of ten, and it could be 19 out of 20. It could be 29 out of 30, actually, and they don't want to admit that. Civilians killed by drones, not terrorists. So, yeah, we want to keep some of our speculation at bay and just stick with the facts. So I'm not going to go too far, but it's like there's a subtle form of mind control at play here, which is not new. Like, believe the absurd. <laughs> you know, we're, we're going to tell you something absurd with a straight face and have certain people catapult that propaganda. And it's going to be so absurd, but there's going to be so many people echoing that talking points that the herd behavior will take over the thinking process that should understand on a cognitive level, wait a minute, 2 plus 2 equals 4. 2 plus 2 does not equal 5. So I would say that logic, reason, um, they're in a state of shift. Yes, unfortunately. And if you don't mind, I would like to read... To kind, of exp to kind of further expound upon that shift that you were mentioning, I would like to read, if you don't mind, the first uh, few, uh, the first paragraph or so of that Trumpism article I mentioned a moment ago. I just pulled it up, but I think this would be valuable for the listeners because it really gives an idea about just kind of where a lot of this, uh, I guess you could say a type of psychosis is coming from, if you don't mind. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, I would say that, that that directly is related to what I'm kind of alluding to without speculating too far. But I mean, look, now that I've already gone there, I mean, for the record, because I've already stated it, I don't believe that Hillary is going to be the next president. The purpose of pushing Obama through in a rigged election, completely opposite 180 of what the mainstream talking points are in the alternative media today. I see this being done with the intention of creating a level of unrest that we have never yet seen in our lifetimes. When you see videos like that where people are attacking Trump supporters, it's horrific. It's heartbreaking. I don't support any of that, nor have I engaged in any of that behavior. Is some of that provoked? This is going to make some people a little bit upset, Kyle. Is some of that provoked? through Trump statements. I oh, mean, yeah. you know, even before the, the, the people started showing up at the Trump rallies, this is kind of where things kicked off, where the fascist-like nature of the way the man is speaking and dictating like a dictator, that was easy to see from the gate. So you'd have a protester screaming here and there. Well, geez, Kyle, how many of us have seen We Are Change or others, you know, confront Bill Clinton or someone else on Bohemian Grove? You know, oh, oh, then it's okay. But if you have a black person, and I'm sorry to say it like that, and oh my God, Alex is with the black people. And then, you know, this is where some of the thinking sadly is going. Does someone have the right to every now and then go to an event and say, no, you're wrong. This is our sign. We're going to say something to you. We're going to call you out. For years, libertarians and conspiracy researchers have fed on that we are changed style of confronting politicians. But if it's done at a Trump rally, so we notice, get him, get him out of here. Get him out of here. The, the man is commanding a crowd to obey him. And th there, there were subtle ways he did this. Like Roger Marsh, right? Yeah. Well, much, much worse. <laughs> at least Trump isn't visibly drunk. <laughs> and people are like, who are you guys talking about Roger Marsh? Uh, check out my video, Who is Bruce Doucette? And you'll be on your way. But, you know, we see these characters 
from the grassroots like Roger Marsh, who was related to the Sovereign Citizen Movement and, and, and Bundy, and he tried to get people rallied up in Costilla County, and we suspect he may have been an agent or mentally ill. But I don't really buy the idea that he was just bored and mentally ill and drunk. I think there was something behind that. He was using authority to galvanize support. And he galvanized support to the point where he had people asses in the seat in a house in Costilla County listening, but ultimately they didn't really support him. And he was actually taken out of the picture. Had he not been taken out of the picture and arrested because he went up there with warrants, again, suspicious, why are you going to go play off-grid patriot hero when you actually have warrants? Kind of strange. So people were responding to that. They responded to that authoritarianism with Donald Trump. And, and it's what I'm saying is it's building. Back to the parallel with Alex Jones. There was a black comedian. Did you catch that clip as well? His last name was Andre. I think Ernie Andre out of Cleveland, Ohio. Yes, I saw the two different videos from the two different angles that you put up on your channel, yeah. And, and to watch his is a little bit more comical because it's better sound quality. So you got a camera guy around and he's, just, he's asking like ridiculous things. He's, he's like a black Tom Green, <laughs> which I think was kind of funny. Tom Green was on. But you know what? You got a black guy with an afro. And so an Alex Jones, we're going, come on, bring on the Democrat. Bring on the fucking Pentagon paid Black Lives Matter, Soros, you know, blah, 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 down the talking points. And, and the guy handled himself pretty well and said some outrageous stuff like, you know, I don't know, uh, you could sleep with my wife, man. I mean, just to say the most outrageous thing, which <clears throat> there were some people that were laughing, but it's when he went off the stage that you saw a few people pushing him. And it was very reminiscent mm. of what we saw with some of the Trump protesters, as I was getting to, punched in some cases, pushed. Now, it wasn't as bad with Ernie, but you have that same mentality that you're just talking about. And now we can see at the Alex Jones rallies. And before, you know, I thought he was brave. I've seen big black guys get in his face and tell him he's a punk. You know, and he's still, you know, with a, with a crew, small crew, held his own. Now he's going into the rallies with protection, his personal security, and police. I mean, that, that's a pretty big move. That's a pretty big shift. So he's worried about something clearly. And... I think that Alex Jones knows that what he's doing is wrong. And I don't want to get too spiritual in this podcast, but let me just say this, because I do get into that direction in a lot of my uh, videos. When you know you're doing wrong, then you watch your back. When you know you're in the right, you have faith in God, as some of these people profess, profess to be Christians, as you know, Kyle. So, you know, if you're running around watching your back all the time, you know, it's because you know that you're doing something wrong and that somebody at one point may try to pop one off in your direction or throw a punch at you. And I think that it's obviously demonstrated that Alex Jones is not, he's not the same strong man bodybuilder that he used to be. His health is, is in a state of collapse. Whether or not the, um, the fake testosterone boosters and the iodine and, and the Kool-Aid that he sells has anything to do with that? Probably not. Probably his lifestyle. And, you know, there's more people also saying that Alex Jones seems to be drunk more often or intoxicated or under the influence of something. Who knows? But uh, that's my speculation there, that he knows what he's doing is wrong. And so now he's watching his back. What's interesting, and then we'll get back to Trump's highlights, is to see how he has surrounded himself with lockstep yes men uh, in the form of his employees and his cameramen. Yeah, and what happened to all those other guys like um, like like Dykes or Burmis or you know some of those other guys from the past? Sure. I mean, you don't see any of them anymore. So well, even his that. crew has just kind of vanished. Most of them. Alex Jones has always been very obsessed with image. So you know, I feel sense that you know Jason Burmis didn't make him look good first of all, through his broadcast, hosting the show. So, you know, I get the feeling he's thrown Jason away like a lot of other people, Jack Blood, others. But I would say that I agree with you that Dykes, as well as Melissa Melton, and there was also a person by the name of David Ortez, these people came across as more legitimate 
reporters. You know, they didn't get super emotional. Um, they were reporting decent stuff at the time. And, and Paul Watson's done great work. And then he shifted. Mm -hmm. But in this major shift from Alex Jones going from semi-okay to a little bit more out in the deep end to getting a little bit more nasty and actually doing videos where in, in, Freudian slip is what comes to mind. He does a video called uh, Alex Jones Joins the New World Order. And it basically is a fictional short movie with him yelling at Aaron Dykes and other employees in the office saying that they're now going to only eat the food that sold in the vending machine of his InfoWars studio. And the whole thing was not supposed to be about him, but like comical, you know, about the whole control in the workplace. But it's very Freudian because he does control his employees. He's controlling what the content is. The reason you don't know the full story about what it was like to work for him from these people is because they live in fear of being sued by Alex Jones because of the confidentiality agreements where you can't disclose anything about working with an individual or his legal team will go after these individuals. So that's the, um, that's the short answer on that. Now, what degree of cooperation, collaboration, communication is there between Trump and Alex? That we just don't know. You know, we saw the, um, the endorsement of Trump for president and, you know, that, that really, again, this whole issue of Trump has split the liberty movement. And I'm trying to understand, without speculating too far, what is going on with some of these individuals that we respect, including those that we won't name, that you know have put out a lot of good content for many, many years. And on one video they're saying, hey, you know, we can't demonize all Muslims, you know, and 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 call for this race war when the government created ISIS. And then two months later, they will agree with Donald Trump's plan to ban all immigration from all countries affected by terrorism. Now, I don't have the answers, but uh, it's happening. You know, this is this is a mirror of what we saw with the Obama supporters. And what we know from that experience, and this is what what saddens me a little, Kyle, uh, on, on the situation, concerns me. The Obama supporters didn't listen or seem to care when we talked about the civilians dead, when we talked about the drones. They didn't care, they didn't believe it. They don't wanna look at it for themselves when we said that he appointed the head of Monsanto to head the agricultural department. You know, and, and by the way, it's good we're talking about this because you know, a lot of the people criticizing Trump, they're not discussing the whole system. You know, they are discussing things for the most part from the left perspective. And I think what we're doing, Kyle, is trying to bridge that gap because we're not invested in the left or right. I mean, we're the same old guys we were a few years ago. We care about liberty, mm -hmm. freedom. We understand that trading our liberty for security will result in a situation where we don't get either. So I think that what we're gonna get from Trump, I guess kind of our closing comments here, and we'll come back and probably follow up as the week progresses because I think we're going to see more radical speeches. I think that now that he's been, oh, you know, the establishment hates Trump. Obviously, that's not the case. Obviously, every time you go to Facebook and you go to YouTube, there's Trump's face, just like Obama. Exactly eight years ago, Trump the savior. Trump, the guy coming on the plane and the people worshiping the plane. We've seen Bush with the halo above his head. We've seen Obama with the halo above his head. And so, you know, I think that he's the real establishment pick. I think that Putin likes Trump because Trump, well, first of all, Trump and Putin are probably collaborators or business partners. And if we do more research, that's probably what we'll find out. Just like anyone that's done the research can see that Trump was the main contributor to the Clinton Foundation. Now I think as where we're going down into the deeper, true, rabbit hole of the new world order ties the new world order connection to all this because putin was also a number one contributor to the clinton foundation and so we actually see a connection between all these characters vladimir putin hillary clinton and donald trump in my opinion that's pretty close for comfort 
in my opinion, Kyle, that's like in plain sight. But no, 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 no. Everybody's been taught to just think Bilderberg Group. And the Masons and the Skull and Bone Society and the Vatican. So it's like people have been kind of programmed to only look in these directions. Meanwhile, you have an obvious plain sight reality where it is undisputed that there is a, a ongoing friendship between the Clinton family and Donald Trump. So I'm going to pause there because we're actually marveling and looking at the ultimate hypocrisy right here. And, and people that are able to support Trump because he's not Hillary without even like taking in this. No, this is not a Hillary Clinton talking point. This is real. And that other video I uploaded, he he's he's on CNN. Oh, the establishment hates Trump. I mean, it's every, I just want to say that it's like some sort of a weird sound effect because that is not the case. So we see him with his Clinton family connections, probably very deep social media connections, Facebook, uh, Google News, Twitter. Why is it that whatever Donald Trump tweets becomes like this holy thing like trump tweeted this and i've been noticing this cross promotion between twitter and trump raging for six months now yeah i've i've noticed that too and it's just kind of silly to assume that trump is somehow the anti-establishment candidate when in fact he is very much a part of the establishment i would encourage anybody to look back I think you even got some footage uh, that you put up even recently, a compilation of some of the older footage of Trump being in the corporate media where he's saying things like, I am pro-choice and I am for gun control. And he's, and he's basically saying my sympathies lie more with the Democratic Party than not and, and all these kind of things. So I think that flip-flopping when it is, you know, depending on the winds of political expediency, I think is very important to keep in mind. And, you know, as, um, as some people have mentioned in recent years, even when you look at politicians, just keep this in mind. They lie, they lie, they lie. And exactly. they do. And they do. And he, he is also perceived to be a candidate with a non-intervention isolationist foreign policy. <laughs> How is that the case? When he's screaming like a fanatic that we are going after the barbarians. A couple other points and then some closing statements. There's a reason why the real white supremacy movement in the United States, which is undisputed, and nationalism, you know, these, these, these controlled movements that are supposedly anti-New World Order, but it's like there's still global government coming from their actions and more war, economic collapses, people living in poverty, racial tensions. So, you know, these, these nationalist movements that are popping up in Europe in response to the immigration and this nationalist America first, you know, there's a reason why, again, some people are responding in a violent way to that. Not that it's right, but that, you know, his statements are there to provoke and frighten. I certainly think that they're trying to terrify Middle Eastern people and, and, and create an even racial, greater racial divide by this whole Trump versus Black Lives Matter thing. And so when you have a significant amount of people in the alternative media going in a more racially charged direction, I mean, it's it can be seen in the YouTube comment section. There's some stuff that's been directed at me, but really I see how people are talking about others. I see how there is like a subtle return to uh, traditional white supremacist ideas, such as all blacks, the lie that all blacks genetically are disposed to raping white women. And, you know, I had someone say that to me once, you know, and of course I didn't hang out with that person. And I think it's strange for people to have friendships with people that think about these things on a regular basis you know it's it's insanity so i i'm concerned for the post trump the people of america and the world in the post trump presidency in a post trump america you know i i, I just see riots 
and street fights and more, maybe more stories of gang rape where you have people getting back at something. Mean, here's a story I saw on the Daily Caller, regardless of Tucker Carlson's involvement in that paper and what a bastard he is. But, you know, you see a story about um, a black football player who's being sent to prison for him and his friends gang raping a white girl. None of that's okay. But when you have people on the other side acting like we're going to do something about the black people or, you know, we're going to create our own. I mean, there's nothing wrong with wanting dignity regardless of what racial background you are, including white. There's a way to go about asking for respect from others and not being demonized because you're white or black or Hispanic. There's ways to go about that in a more productive, respectful, positive manner. Uh, but responding with racism because of what's being put out in the mainstream and blaming all groups or all protesters because you have a few bad apples, I guess you could say. But I don't think it's the majority. I don't think the majority of the Black Lives Matter or Occupy people for that matter, even though I'm not involved with supporting what they're doing, I don't believe that they ultimately have evil intent and they're all walking around with Soros paychecks. So, you know, I think what we're trying to do, Kyle, is we're trying to prevent people from getting super emotional. And that's what people are doing. They're getting super emotional. And like clockwork, you know, we see social media raging with this whole back and forth, back and forth. And it's like, you know, it, it's really too bad that after decades of research for so many people, it's only gone the direction of Clinton and her fucking emails. And I mean, <laughs> they, they, they have made it in the propaganda machine, the fallacy that Clinton is the only person in government and Obama involved in wrongdoing. I mean, the whole fabric of the philosophy of the average libertarian or conspiracy researcher, although conspiracy research has been given a really bad name, is that politics are controlled and that there are controllers behind the puppets. I mean, there's a reason they call them puppets. So we've seen people like Alex Jones and others of influence go from conspiracy research to it's really all about this one person. And if we can just put Clinton in pow me in the ass prison as one person referred to it, which I think is highly graphic and disturbing, the obsession on this woman getting gang raped in the butt. So there, there's like an evil creeping. You know, it's like a Metallica song. <laughs> and, and, and it is. What are some of your closing statements, Kyle? And you know, what are some of your concerns for the future? You know, some of your speculations uh, with where this could go? And, and do you also see Trump being the real pick? Or do you think that it's too close to call? Well, first thing I'll say is, because I always want to end on an, on an action note, as, as you know, um, you know, I'll support uh, a brand new cause for, for people who want to call it that. And I think even you suggested it a little bit ago uh, in a, one of your recent videos, uh, hashtag Afghan lives matter. You know, if somebody wants to get that started, I'll support it. Uh, and I think there's a good number of reasons to do so. Number one. It's the anti-war position. It's the constitutional position because the because regardless of what you think about 9/11, Afghanistan should never have been invaded in 2001, even as a matter of law. It should never have been invaded, ever. That there's no excuse for that. I don't care who you are. The second thing is that it'll piss off the neocons, and yes, it'll piss off the patriots, and rightly so because they deserve to be humiliated, and they deserve to be, uh, let's say, rightly put back in their place and humbled quite a bit because they have been openly advocating for the outright oppression of an entire portion of the human uh, species just simply because of their religion and or ethnicity or some combination thereof. And there's no, that's not, that's unconscionable. There's no good reason to ever do that. You know, people are individuals. Hold people accountable for their own individual actions. Don't do this group or, or collective guilt thing like how some folks uh, like to do that. That's, that's never justified, whether uh, in the Anglo-Saxon common law tradition or, or much of anything else, at least as far as I'm aware of. Regarding the actual election itself, um, 
I think I think this will be a, a, a difference of opinion betwixt you and I, but I consider it more minor because obviously this is a bit of forecasting and ultimately it doesn't matter, at least for me, because I'm an ex-voter and I do not consent to being governed at all by anybody. But just for purposes of the forecasting and all that, um, you know, I always kind of suspected it would be a Hillary versus Trump matchup. And now that Trump is officially the GOP nominee and Hillary is the presumptive nominee for the uh, Democrats, I wouldn't be surprised at all if Hillary managed to slide in because, not because she's doing anything smart in terms of political strategy, not because she's a particularly wonderful person, but because for people who uh, may not be aware of this or some of the uh, uh, folks in the audience who may have been, who may have been knowledgeable about what the alternative media has been saying for years is there's a documentary I would suggest people watch, an older documentary called Hacking Democracy. If Hillary Clinton wins, it'll probably be because of electoral fraud. And if Donald Trump wins, it'll probably be due to electoral fraud. So the entire notion of representative democracy, of electing people to Congress or your sheriff, county sheriff or the local district attorney, you know, prosecutors and such, um, none of this really matters because the votes can very easily be stolen and there, uh, the elections can be stolen because there's simply no trace uh, that there was ever a, a fraud. There's no paper trail. There's no digital trail. There's no nothing. And many people thought that George W. Bush stole the presidency away from Al Gore. And unfortunately, as far as I'm aware of, Alex, we'll never know the answer to that because there is no evidence because the, the technology, the um, uh, the electronic voting machines and, and even other related things, even relating to some of the paper ballots, interestingly enough, uh, in some ways, because everything's based on those memory cards in the machines, um, there's no there's no there's no way to prove that there was ever actually any fraud. So it's just type, 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 go into the back end of it, you know, do your little fraud steal election and that's it. So, you know, chances are, you know, people remember presidents are selected. They're not elected. So the only question is really not who's being elected, but who's being selected. And frankly, you know, whether it's Trump or it's Hillary, I don't think very much matters for whatever it's worth. I think Hillary is more likely to steal the election, but don't, uh, but I don't think anybody should underestimate Trump. I mean, Alexander Hamilton was no friend of liberty with all of his mercantilism and protectionism and anti-free trade rhetoric with wanting to impose tariffs and of even subsidies back then in the 1790s. They were even talking about subsidies for industry. That was in the report on manufacturers in 1791. So I'll just finish with this, Alex. In some ways, the election is too close to call, but even if people were to assume that Hillary would be selected through electoral fraud, you know, it's just, well, it'll be the Clintons for another four, possibly even eight years, and that will be a very exciting ride, wouldn't it? Well, what we've seen apologists for these presidents do is say, oh, no, that was Bush's war. Obama just inherited it. So the other additional points that need to be made, and we're going to come back and go deeper into this, it's the geopolitical situation that will result from all of this, how China reacts, how Russia reacts, despite the friendliness that we're seeing right now. There's, there's definitely like some sort of a, a veiled joke right now with this whole, uh, you know, certain nations being in favor of Trump. There's really a deception there. So Trump is actually going to inherit the geopolitical situation which, as it is, is running concurrent to the rising civil unrest. So, you know, we're talking South China Sea. We're talking NATO in the Black Sea. Uh, we're talking all-time high number of war games, but not just our, on our end, but out of the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, deals. We keep hearing about deals, deals. It's all rhetoric. The real major deal is going on. We see China making a deal with Israel to build an island. We see Russia making a deal with Israel to build oil fields. That's heavy duty stuff. This is actually going over the head of these pro Putin, pro Trump, supposed conspiracy researchers, liberty minded individuals. Uh, the connections between Russia and Hillary over the head of those that like Putin but don't like Hillary. They're not touching those stories, they're not seeing that connection. So Trump's going to inherit by design a complicated geopolitical situation. And so my speculation is that this is going to lead to World War III. 
one thing that he mentioned in his speech was we're going to renegotiate with China. Now, that's interesting. That's interesting because a lot of economists have pointed out that the United States may annul on its debt to China. And this has been kind of a you know, reoccurring dialogue that Americans, real researchers that look into China and what's going on and their buy up of the United States and real estate. So to also end on an action point, you know, during uh, Bush's rise and during Obama's rise, and we can look at Alex Jones and both of those, we saw documentaries come out to kind of highlight aspects, but not all, but aspects of their ties to the system. And in some cases, there was a little bit of exaggeration. <laughs> um, with the case of Trump, I can't think of a decent documentary that's been made. None. There, there are just, none. Yeah, and, and Hillary's not behind anything to expose Trump because in reality, they are in cahoots as the financial trail documents. So, Kyle, we're going we're gonna to maybe collaborate on some articles with the Clinton-Trump connection. It will look closer at the Putin-Trump connection and Trump's other associates. You know, it's just, it's ridiculous for people to say, well, it's okay for him to be a corporate insider, but he's not a political insider because blah, 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 blah. But, but in a way, he is a political insider. He's been rubbing elbows with these people for a long, long time. So, hey, if anyone in the audience is out there is feeling creative, you know, feeling um, like you want to get more active, I'll tell you an area of research that is yet to really be uncovered. And it's the full story to the Donald Trump deception. Uh, so with that, we'll end this. Kyle, thanks for coming on. Uh, I look forward to doing more of these with you. You too, Alex.